The dub's ability to innovate their playsets, changing things up from how they normally run certain plays, was key to beating a man who knows all of their playsets in Mike Brown in Game 3. This zipper hook two-man playset, where in this case a stagger screen is set by DiVincenzo along with Lamb, gets Curry the clean swing from Wiggs. However, Lyles heavily closes out. Hey, Lyle. But we're talking about the greatest marksman of all time here. Steph only needs an inch of room, and playsets like that one from Kerr have been his bread and butter for years. Steph's bond with shooting coach Bruce Frazier has somehow made him an increasingly dangerous deep range assassin over the years before getting back to the playbook and into a primary narrative from game three. Just 12.5% of you watching are subscribed, so please subscribe and please drop a like on this video. It takes a few seconds and makes a massive difference. A 35 empty punch, which usually would see the man in pool spot slip to the hoop, instead gets Looney the wide open cut, with the Kings scouting for the opposite to happen, and Kavon dumps it off to Wiggs. Golden State's offense flows in such a way that gets the best out of their players, whether key pieces are missing or not. Like every all-time great that's ever graced the court, Stephen Curry has a way of making everyone surrounding his team, from fans to commentators to skeptics to pure haters to his teammates and coaching staff, love him. Everyone wants a piece, and everyone's expectations are ultimately fulfilled. The passion is just expressed in a multitude of ways. In terms of on this channel, you'll see a lot of praise for the likes of Stephen Curry. That's how I operate as an individually run mogul of a media platform. Conversely, from stations like 95.7 The Game, their expression of gratitude weirdly comes in the form of an overly demeaning tone delivering challengingly harsh, tough love. Nevertheless, criticism like you're about to hear, that albeit has the intention of being motivating, comes off as pure blasphemy. Where is Steph Curry? Hey, well, he's Steph, at 29. I don't man. care. He has the, not been a factor in the series. From three. He has not. What? I'm sorry. Uh, 33 percent from stinks. three. No doubt. And 48. He has from not the field. been a factor in the series. We'll get to the reason why that was so blasphemous in a second. But then you had LaShannon Sharp saying this about Steph's finals performance last year before Game Three. Look at the Boston series. Get what that Game Four in which he goes. Oh, for, he, he goes for 43. But we overlook that he really didn't play outside of that Game Four. He really didn't. Play great. He didn't play great. The petty king Stephen Curry, as Kevon Looney recently stated, is one of many Warrior players who sees every source of mainstream news regarding them. Reason why that initial criticism was so insane entering this game. Where is Steph Curry? Was that even before this most recent Game 3 statement, the Warriors were plus 14 in Steph's 77 minutes, while a minus 23 in non-Steph playing time, which was only 19 minutes, he combined to score 58 points on 64.4% true shooting over the first two games of this series before facing the just played criticism from 95.7 the game. In terms of LaShannon, this picture where aside from the 43 point game in the finals last year, you can see Steph posted four other games within this six game series of posting at least 29 points that the former NFLer was just trying to get clicks with a false hot take. Meanwhile, in Game 3, Steph dropped a 36-piece on 50% three-point shooting, making six of those triples. In the showing, we hadn't seen this expressive of a Jordan Poole in about a damn year. As Stan Van Gundy pointed out on the air, Jaron Jackson Jr. shouldn't have been the Defensive Player of the Year. That should have been the drastically underappreciated Warrior fan base. The Dubs are 28th defensively on the road and third best at home. Meanwhile, I said yesterday the X Factors for this series were Malik Monk for the Kings and Jordan Poole for the Dubs. That proved to be true in the result of this one, as Kerr's aggressive game planning on Monk held him to four points on one for nine shooting from the floor. Meanwhile, JP wasn't that efficient either, but he made an impact from the jump with his energy, pushing of the tempo. He was getting downhill into the foul line as well. In the end, the game's best player in Stephen Curry, along with Wiggs, Poole, Dante, Kaminga, Moody, and company, made the current lighting of the Beam Kings resemble their old bottom-feeding selves. Ending a dynasty will be no easy task for Sacktown, and Thursday night proved just that.
The Dubs' combination of offensive execution and defensive intensity looked as good as it has all year, and they may be starting to shift the narrative away from the beam lighting kings, especially as their two best defenders in Draymond and GP2 return for Sunday's Game 4. Kaminga put a near baptization on Alex Len. If it means anything, that would have been one of the greatest posters of all time had it went down. From a mental standpoint, an under-talked about make-or-break factor in the game of basketball, for Stephen Curry specifically, it's whether or not he can maintain the proper mix of a sharp edge to be driven from within and a firm belief in himself and the script. Steph's defensive intensity, in addition to Jordan Poole's, was fantastic, whether it was closing out on shooters, blitzing players on drives to the bucket, or just their general body language. Moving up in the depth chart due to injuries, Steve Kerr had to say to Anthony Lamb, Come on out, you rapist! Wow. Without Gary Payton II and Draymond Green, two of this team's best defenders, Bob's prized acquisition of Lamb had a momentum-shifting blocked shot in the corner. Defensively, Lamb isn't the most laterally quick by any stretch, but his backpedaling effort was very solid in drop coverage. Kevon Looney was missing layups and not getting a ton of lift in the restricted area early on, but ended with a crazy stat line of 4 points and 20 rebounds. Gotta love the work that Loon Dog provides night in, night out. What a class act Kevon is, as he really helps out with the Warriors' general likability. This was Steph's take on Kevon's effort. He's relentless. Um, like you say, I, I don't know what that probably feels like, but it's just the way you see the ball, the angles, your effort, knowing that it's going to be physical, you're going to get knocked around, but he's just, you know ready to take. He knows how to be effective. Curry would say before this one they needed to get the crowd involved early in Game 3, and they did exactly that. Climaxing when Monk was blocked from behind by Steph, and Curry got three free throws on a triple after pushing it up the floor. Back to Jordan Poole, and the hate for JP was insane coming into this game. He evidently took it personally. Despite playing on half an ankle as Klay Thompson described, Poole's taken ridiculously disrespectful flack from the likes of Kevin O'Connor, who said, quote, Jordan Poole, I have no hope for him. He's not a good basketball player. He's getting benched in the second half for good reason, end quote. Colin Cowherd said, quote, if you think Jordan Poole is a good basketball player, you don't know basketball, end quote. And despite Bill Simmons last year gushing over Jordan, ranking him above Lamelo, he and a friend during his podcast tore JP to shreds. Just listen. By the way, have you seen Jordan Poole's contract? Like, are you comfortable with that guy's contract as a one-way, at best, a one-way player who can only play offense at best? Well, it has, his contract hasn't even started yet, Bob. I think it kicks in next year for like $30 million a year. And I don't it's an know if it's tradable. Contract. He's definitely one of the worst defensive guards in the league, I'll say that. Was it an amazing night for Poole? And am I saying he's the best basketball player? Absolutely not. Did he deserve to be torn to shreds by, for some reason, respected yet undeniably acclaimed media figures despite playing on half an ankle? Absolutely not. You heard Poole was called one of the worst defensive guards in the league from that clip of Simmons. Well, he racked up this steal on one of the opening possessions where he sneaks up on Sabonis, elusively blitzing him to force the turnover before filling out the lane in transition and watching one of his two fellow splash triplets knock down the triple. JP also recorded the opening bucket on a two-handed throwdown and recorded three steals defensively in total on the night as he was engaged all game, which you can thank the haters for, I guess. Realistically, Poole's evidently hampered right now, and you have to cut him some slack. But don't forget, this is the man who was a bona fide staple in the 2022 NBA Finals, helping secure the Dubs their fourth chip in eight years. Sophomore Moses Moody was big time in the absence of GP2 and Dre, knocking down a few first quarter triples, ultimately contributing to a team high off the bench of 13 points. Moody said post game, quote, humbly speaking, I've always been a winner, end quote. Dante DiVincenzo had been struggling before this buzzer-beating scoop lay-in, where he pulls off an insane crossover where he definitely got away with the carry, but as 1998 Michael Jordan once taught us all, if you can hide it from the refs, it's legal. Solid performance from Dante all around, as while he shot two for eight, he racked up four steals. Kerr made it a point of emphasis, and has all year, that the key is handling the minutes without Steph better as opposed to playing Curry more. 
The Dubs handled it swiftly in this one, while they struggled with that in the opening games of this series. It's funny how so many people doubt Kerr when he has the best winning percentage of any coach in playoff history. Not to mention, an extremely deep playbook. You do anything when you hit 12 turnovers. Like, you know, the goal you're like 12 turnovers or less would be ideal. You hit it. Do you like celebrate somehow? Because it's, it's that rare. Uh, I'm going to have a margarita right now. <laughs> but I was going to do that even if we had 25 turnovers. Steph spoke on his sub pattern post game, saying, quote, We just wanted to keep y'all guessing with my rotations and minutes. Might switch it up again in game four. End quote. If you're a Kings fan, Kerr replacing Draymond in the starting five with Jordan Poole worked to perfection. The spacing was excellent, the movement without the ball and sticking to the playbook was bought into. The dubs vibe off the body language of Jordan Poole, and despite evidently being hampered by the ankle setback, I thought he did a better job of rotating over for decent closeouts, and he was engaged and the enthusiastically hilarious JP that we all grew to know and love. Overall, Game 3 in San Fran had the ultimate feel of an intense must-win playoff game, much to do with the most valuable fan base across all of sports in Dub Nation, bringing the energy. They say, you know, Draymond's got a history, so do we, so we, we know how to bounce back.